Good morning. Morning. Good morning. It's really good to for, see everybody here and to um, welcome Stuart, um, who's going to be bringing God's word to us later. He's going to be talking on Colossians and speaking about a relationship with God. And his sort of punchline is, we are complete in him. So we look forward to hearing from him. So um, I thought we'd just start with um, a song, so be still. few notices. Um, firstly, to say that there will be tea and coffee after the service. It's Father's Day today, so we thought it would be um, good to meet and stay around and speak. So I think thank you, Kirsty and Dan, for sorting that out. Um, Sharon. Morning. Um, I hope to have a photo for you, but um, I couldn't download one, so I haven't. Um, to say that we had a wonderful time at Lighthouse uh, last month, which seems bizarre. It feels like it was a long time ago now, or the 1st of June it was. We had 57 children, and 57 seems to be a popular number, because that's the number we're taking to Spree. Um, so yeah, we're looking forward to that next weekend. So just to highlight for you, if you're free Thursday evening, about half past five, you can come along to Showbrook Park. We've got three marquees and about 15 tents to put up because we've got a lot of people. So we need all hands on deck. So if you're free, uh, either just turn up or give me a call. But yeah, we'll definitely be there half past five um, on Thursday evening. And then the only other thing to say is please pray. The weather so far looks like it's dry to put the tents up. Ideally, I'd like it to be dry when we take them down. Otherwise, that's a whole other issue that we need to deal with. And also just that the children that come along, the majority of them are unchurched. They're really excited. Um, but yeah, it will be an interesting time for them to grow and to learn something about faith. And we also hope that those who've been before will again enjoy being a part of that massive group of young people, enjoying time spent discovering their faith or exploring their faith or just deepening their faith so we just ask that you pray for us as leaders that we all get some rest 
Some are choosing to sleep at home, you know, so they get some rest. Uh, and they're mentioning no names, husband of mine. Um, he's leaving me all on my own. Um, but yeah, just that I know, ah, oh, I know, in a tent, all on my lonesome. Only because I snore and I wouldn't inflict that on other people because then they won't sleep. Um, so yeah, just ask that you be pray, you be with us, think of us on Sunday morning. Yeah, and just thank you so much for all your support. And yeah, I'll be back to tell you what happened. Hopefully no mishaps, lots of fun um, and lots of enjoyment for everyone. So thanks. Thank you, Sharon. And I think the only other no notice was from Claire, um, which is that um, the deadline for, the inf for returning information with regard to our response to the Children and Family Workers Project um, I think quite a lot of us, and I know that I'm guilty of this, have said this verbally, but actually either Claire or Sylvia need this in writing. I'm told this can either be a hard copy of the sheets that we were given or an email, um, but by the end of today, because they're meeting tomorrow. So, um, yeah. So I think that that is all I noticed, unless anybody else has got anything that they wish need to bring. So, if we can sing now, um, praise the name of the Lord. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus lay.
And so Stuart is going to come and speak to us at, in a little bit on from Colossians. So our reading this morning. So then, just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition, and the basic principles of this would rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in body form, and you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. In him, you were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with a circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive in Christ. He forgave all our sins, having cancelled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us, he took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. And so... We're going to sing again, and at the end of this song, um, the children will leave.
So now as we um, move to a time of prayer, I can't remember who it was, but somebody um, about six weeks ago or so got us together into sort of smaller groups around the church. And I thought, shall we try that again? Um, so, yeah, so though this might cause chaos, um, I was just wondering whether people could sort of um, move into groups of sort of six or eight or so, so about five, five, five or six groups around the church to pray together. Um, I think we've got lots to pray about. Um, we've got the children's and family workers meeting tomorrow evening. Um, we've got Spree coming up this weekend. Um, we've got um, so people in our community. So um, I heard from Julie last night that Barry's getting better. So that's good news. We give we give thanks for that. But we we are also aware of other people in our community who are less well, who are struggling. We're aware of those people in the wider community who at this time are struggling through loneliness, isolation, through financial difficulties, particularly at this time. So we just pray for all those issues. So if we get into small groups and pray together, and then in about three or four or five minutes, I will close with the Lord's Prayer. I can hear the sound gradually subsiding, so shall we close in the words of the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. But deliver us from station from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So if we all slightly rearrange the chairs and um, just give a moment to get the musicians back sorted, and then we're going to sing another song before Stuart comes to bring God's word to us. my 
Good morning. I'll have a quick look round. You'll be looking at me for the next oh, four hours, is it? Or so. It is good to be here, you, at long last. Um, although I live a long way away, so it's actually 3.1 mile, I believe. Some of you, I suppose, I know to a certain extent, and vice versa, some of you know me. But in order to sort of start to develop a relationship with you, I wonder how, would you, how you would feel, if, because I'm a nice guy, but don't believe everything you hear, if I offered you a bundle of £20 notes, okay, and said they're yours for £100. Now, having just put £120 in my diesel tank last yesterday, £100 isn't an awful lot. But how would you feel? Would you think Stuart's totally lost his marbles, a lot of them, gone? Or would you think they were fakes? Or maybe, well, they might be fakes, but hey, if you actually knew where I was financially at the moment, then if I could borrow £100, then all my worries would be over well, for a short period of time anyway. And maybe it's just worth taking that risk. Of course, before I go any further, yes, they would be fakes, I can assure you. But just by looking at them in my hand, you might not see they are fakes. If they're good, if they're good quality ones, then sometimes it's hard for even an expert, a trained specialist, to tell the real from the substitute. And the same is perhaps true about our lives in general. Sometimes it's difficult, even for the smartest of us, to, to know when we're encountering a cheap substitute for the real thing. And this could be in relationships, philosophy, spirituality, and almost every um, area of our life. And it's quite a pain, isn't it, when we thought that we had the real thing only to become aware that we've got something which is nothing like the original. And I think that one of the problems we may have isn't that we like nice things, but rather that we're too quick to settle for substitutes. We settle for good, but the good ends up nothing like what we ought to have had in the first place and enjoyed. C.S. Lewis puts it like this. He said... We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. We're rather like an, in the, rather like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday by the sea. We are, Lewis says, far too easily pleased. Since becoming a Christian, well, 52 years ago now, I have, as you can imagine, especially in the earlier days, visited many types of churches, not only just for interest's sake, but really to find out what the Lord wanted from me and where he wanted me to go, what he was saying to me. And after spending some time trawling, for want of a better word, these places of worship, I began to realise that one of our greatest spiritual temptations is that not only do we tend to mistake a counterfeit or substitute spirituality for the real thing, but to push the boat out even further, we often accept the substitute rather than spending time going after the real thing. Now, I believe it's of eternal importance to do this. And so this morning we're going to spend a little time just hopefully confirming what the real thing is, spiritually speaking. Now, what I believe Paul is trying to tell us here is that once we've experienced the real thing, not just because of words, but because of what we've experienced with the living Christ, that deep, deep relationship, that deep conviction that we can have, then the substitute looks pretty well substitute, I suppose. And that's because Christian spirituality is all about experiencing the genuine article. 
We won't need or even be interested in anything less than the genuine article when we've had the real thing. I don't want to spend a lot of time this morning looking in detail at the substitutes available rather than just recognising that they are out there. There's a huge market still for spirituality. Um, and to be honest, it can be so tempting to take it all in because we're so hungry, we're so hungry spiritually. As human beings, we're made to be spiritually aware. We live in a time, I think, that's so similar in some respects to the one that the, one, the folks who live in Corinth, Galatia and Colossus faced a couple of thousand years ago. There are so many options for spirituality out there that the problem isn't finding one that looks good, but there are too many options, and so many of them, that not only look good, but can also be um, believable. If you've checked with our website, the Rings Ash Circuit website, Ken put some isms on there, didn't he? Skepticism, postmodernism, moralism, emotionalism, pluralism, and Uncle Tom Cobbley and all. And they're all out there. And so many people try to mix and match their faith values from the spirit, different spiritual <coughs> options that are out there. And very sadly, the same things are happening within some Christian denominations today, where folk are being led away from the teachings of Scripture and into the thoughts and the ideology of the culture in which we live. Brothers and sisters are being taught by their spiritual leaders a number of things, such as God didn't mean it that way. Scripture has to move on with the times. And that theology can't stand still. It has to evolve. And that was the same situation that was in Galatia, Corinth, Corinth and Colossus. And Paul tells us in verse 8, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than in Christ. Now, we don't really know everything that was going on then, but somehow the church was being tempted to accept some teaching which was a substitute for God's teaching. And I suppose that the chances are they weren't even aware that this was happening. Look, let's not forget, Satan usually is very, very clever. And we don't set out, do we, to accept cheap substitutes. It just happens. Anyway, Paul hears about it, and he writes this letter to them. And he says, look, don't settle for anything but the real thing. Don't settle for anyone other than Jesus. And this is so important, because we don't want our spiritual lives on something which ends on being a cheap substitute for the real thing, do we? And Paul gives us a couple of reasons for this in his passage. Firstly, Jesus is everything, everything that we need. Don't accept any substitute for Jesus, because we have everything that we need in him. When we know Jesus and have Jesus, we don't need anything else. He is everything. He's everything that we, we need both now and sometime in the future. But brothers and sisters, if we love the Lord, then we are connected to Jesus, aren't we? Yeah. And we don't need anything else. We can't get a substitute for Jesus for the simple reason there isn't any substitute for Jesus. Paul goes on in verses 9 and 10, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and in Christ you've been brought to fullness. He's the head over every power and authority. What Paul tells us is that Jesus possesses two qualities and makes him all that we need. First, is that God's fullness dwells in him. As we heard, for in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And isn't rocket science, I don't think, to see that when we follow Jesus, we are connected to him. In Christ, says Paul, you have been brought to fullness. We are connected to the one who is God himself. 
He had a human body, yet he is God. Everything that it means to be God, Jesus has. Look, when we're talking about Jesus, we're not talking about someone who is like God, are we? We're talking about someone who is God. And we are connected to him. And in Jesus, we have everything we need. We are totally complete when we have Jesus. So there is nothing or no one else that we need because we're connected to the one who is above every power and authority in the universe. The funny thing is, it was far from obvious at the time. When Jesus walked around, no one sort of looked at him and said, hey, folks, there goes all the fullness of God in a human body. Of course he didn't. He looked like everyone else. He spoke with an accent. He did everything a normal person does. Yet he was different. He was, and he is, God. There again, it didn't look like the Colossian Christians were any different either, did it, from anyone else? Oh, well, yeah, maybe they were a little different in their religious beliefs. They met together with other believers. But people weren't quite sure to make of them. Nobody looked at them and said, Hey, Bill, look, look at them. They are connected to the ones who have fallen us in the, in God, of God in his body. They are connected to the one who is above all things. Of course he didn't. Yet they were. Physically, nobody could tell the difference. But it was true. And today in Mid-Devon, you and I don't look particularly different to anybody else, do we? Mm, maybe some do, okay. People look at us, and I would imagine they see people with mortgages, got jobs, relationship problems, health issues, cars and tractors that sometimes break down, unless they're John Deere, which never do, I've been told. <laughs> Don't believe everything you hear. But we are different, aren't we? And maybe this is scary because we, are, we have such a close relationship with Jesus that we get what he has. And we find our completeness not in what we have ourselves, but in what he gives to us. And I assure you that if our hearts and our minds are one with him, then there is nothing at all of value that we already don't have. No, we might not have the money we want. We might not have the health we want. We might not have the relationship we want. However, there's nothing of the utmost value that we don't have. What we've got inside is for eternity, not just for this life. Just a thought, um, I was driving through Crenton, as one does, um, and coming in from the Exeter area, there's, um, there's a phone shop on the left-hand side. Have you know the one? And there was a big sign outside there. Um, it said, get yourself connected. And as I drove past that, and I thought, get yourself connected. I wonder, are you connected to Christ? So firstly, Jesus is everything we need. And secondly, Jesus has done everything we need. Now, Sarah, my wife and I, don't watch that much TV. Um, it just doesn't do it for us, really. I suppose that the news, rugby, cricket, especially last week, and maybe gardening or the occasional Master Chef programmes, are about it. Unless there's a good documentary to see. However, look, I'm aware that watching the box uh, for many folks is not only a ritual or a habit, but in some cases it's a lifeline to the outside world. Or maybe it's just a form of relaxing. And their complaint is that at times there is absolutely nothing on TV. I don't know how many channels you've got, there's nothing on TV. And they sit there with a little remote in their hand, clicking away until they find themselves the most exciting thing that's on, te on television. The shopping channel. <laughs> you've been there, oh, come on. This is why I haven't been to heal before. I suppose in some respects the shopping channels are similar to a movie. Because they're so entertaining, aren't they? Oh, look at that. That's fantastic. If I had one of them, I could do this, that and the other. And you know where it's coming from. 
And of course, the whole idea of the program is to make you think, I want one of them. I've got to have that. And there's a huge market out there for pushing stuff. And it's no different spiritually either. It's tempting to buy books and watch YouTube and go looking for stuff that's going to help us spiritually. We think we need to add something more, do something more. Okay? To recap, Paul has already said that Jesus is everything that we need. And now he's going further and explains that Jesus has also done everything that we need. In early Christianity, one of the things that Gentile Christians were being told was that what they were missing was circumcision. And that was a pretty tough sell. They were being told by some that if you wanted to be a, a real Christian, you've probably heard these, this term before, then you need to take this extra step. Jesus might be all that you need, but you still need to get circumcised, he said. And it's the same today when we're told that we have to have Jesus plus read this book or that book or follow these three steps or watch this on YouTube or whatever. Have this gift or that gift of the Holy Spirit. Whatever. And Paul says a resounding no. No. Not only is Jesus all that you need, he has also done everything you need. According to Paul, we don't need any extras because it's already been done for us already. Verse 11, when you came to Christ, you were circumcised. Not by a physical procedure, it was a spiritual procedure. The cutting away of your sinful nature. Paul told them that they didn't need to be circumcised because Jesus had already circumcised them. Not physically, of course, but spiritually. They didn't need any additional extras. They didn't need Jesus plus something else. He is everything that they needed. He has done everything that they needed done. I think it's interesting where Paul goes with this thought. He says that God has given us a sign that we have everything we need in Christ. And that sign, according to Paul, in verse 12, is baptism. Now, I don't know you folks here yet. But there might be one or two here this morning who haven't yet been baptised. This wasn't the case for the Colossian followers of Christ. After coming to faith, baptism marked the beginning of someone's journey as a follower of Christ. Believe and baptised is what they believed in. Once you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, accept him as your Lord and Saviour, you then went forward for baptism. And this should be the case for us all as well, shouldn't it? Look, if you haven't been baptised, have a chat with Ken or one of your leaders here and talk, talk to them. They'll be delighted. And Paul says that once you take the first step as a follower of Jesus Christ, everything that you need has been given to you. You're a full participant in everything that Jesus has done for you extra books or whatever might be nice or oh, yes please but you don't need them you already have everything that you need and he tells us about two actions that Jesus has taken that gives us everything that we need first he has forgiven sins verses 13 and 14 tell us when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness which stood against us and condemned us. He's taken it away, nailing it to the cross. As human beings, we have all fallen short of the glory of God. In other words, it doesn't matter who we might be, you have sinned, I have sinned, against God Almighty. And the punishment for this is eternal separation from God. And what Jesus did was to take that list of our sins and our shortcomings and everything we've done wrong, and he nailed it to the cross. 
He dealt with it permanently. And we have been completely forgiven because of what Jesus has done for us. A little question. Have you been forgiven of your sins? Have you asked him? I leave that to you. In Ephesians 6.12, we're told this, and I think this is also scripture for our leaders to take to spree as well. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. See, we don't need anything more than what we've been given. If we are in a relationship with Christ, then we've already been given everything that we need. Don't please ever settle for substitutes. Because in Jesus, you have everything you need or could ever need. So, to close, if, as I say, Jesus is everything that we need, and... Jesus has also done everything that we need. And if we are in a relationship with him, then is that all there is to it? Do we just lay on our spiritual backs saying, thank you, Lord, have a tummy tickled or whatever, and get on with life? And the answer is a resounding no. In order to develop our relationship with him, we have got to grow. We need to read our Bible, and I'd firmly advise reading it every day. We need to include him in every part of our life, which means talking and listening to him about the mundane as well as the more important stuff. And as James tells us in chapter 4, we've got to submit ourselves to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God. And he will come near to you. Amen. So we're just going to close with a final song. Amazing Grace.
we just close with the grace? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.